How many of you are aware that today is a very, very special day in India? What is that? Huh? Shivaratri. Huh? Shivaratri. Just a few words about Shivaratri. It is one of India's most popular, most loved celebration. celebration. And in India, we have many, many celebrations, many, many celebrations. My wife will ask me every time you say, you always say it is the best celebration. <laughs> How many best celebration you have in India? She keeps on asking. So this is one of the very best. Shiva Ratri. Ratri means night. It is a whole day and a whole long night celebration. And one difference I want all of you to understand here in the West, when we celebrate Christmas or Thanksgiving, they are very beautiful celebrations. But the way it is done, there is hardly any spirit involved. Now in India, India also has its own faults. Every culture has their own faults. But in India, when we say celebration, the celebration always begins in the morning, 4 o'clock. And this is winter. Month of February is India also is winter. And in this cold winter, millions of Hindus will get up at 4 o'clock and take a bath in the Ganga. Mm -hmm. You have seen that. Huh? Millions. Ordinary people, children, old people, everybody will. That is the first thing. Taking a dip in the Ganga to cool down the nervous system. Then they will go to a temple or an ashram or to their own home, do mantra chanting, do singing, whole day fasting. And then the whole night, whole night, they will do singing, chanting, mantra chanting. And so it goes on like this. Because the belief is belief. I also don't know. I'm trying to understand myself. This particular day, which is the 14th day of the dark fortnight. Every month it comes, but on this particular month of Halgun, February, March, the alignment of the moon, the moon and the earth, in some way it is aligned in a way that the gravitational power of the moon tends to raise the Kundalini energy. It tends to lift the gravitational power. That is why on this day, the Indian tradition says, don't sleep. Don't lie down. At night, don't lie down. Because if you lie down, then the effect of that pull will not take place. You have to sit up. So at night, 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock, that two-hour period, 11, 12, 1, up to 2 o'clock, that three-hour period, nobody is allowed to lie down. Even if you're falling asleep, you have to sit on a chair straight so that your spine remains straight and the moon can have its effect. This is one big scientific reason which has now come out as to why India always makes certain time very, very holy. Anywhere in nature, nature helps our spiritual growth. We have made that very, very holy. So this day, because I was prepared for some other lecture and because she wants me to give that lecture. <laughs> so so uh, otherwise I would have spoken a little bit more on the Shivaratri. But nevertheless, today I will go on with the Bhagavad Gita. I will go on with my Krishna. My Krishna. I love Krishna more than Shiva. <laughs> so Krishna and Krishna's Bhagavad Gita, I will give this lecture. And from today onwards, this lecture, and maybe if one, two, depending on who is coming, I may extend. But this is the lecture from which I am trying to make my subject matter a little bit more philosophical. One is the devotional aspect, which is good. Other is the intellectual and the philosophical aspect of the teaching, which also sometimes is very, very weak. So today's lecture will be intellectual, philosophical, and that philosophical part is a joy to my heart.
it makes me feel devotion is already there i have to just close my eyes i just close my eyes i don't have to meditate and i always feel always feel immediately i close my eyes there is somebody sitting inside i never feel alone there is somebody sitting inside i can talk to somebody i can ask questions i can fight with that somebody no problem but there is some there is somebody sitting inside and and it is a joy it is a joy to talk to that somebody sitting inside much more joy than we have in our, any of our human relationship so that is the devotional part but once the devotional part is over then comes the intellectual and the higher spiritual so from today onwards we are doing this higher spiritual and in the bhagavad gita the 7th chapter the 8th chapter the 9th chapter these three chapters they have got many things which are of a very highly technical nature scientific nature and philosophical so today's subject matter will be about krishna and krishna always claims ha huh? krishna is one person anywhere in the world who if you can think if a human being stands here and that human being says i am god how will you feel how will you <laughs> so we can't even imagine just one question before we go on to the exact teachings of krishna just one question the question is the latest scientific article i have got a scientific article and two scientists at this moment are trying to say that this whole big vast universe the universe itself is conscious the universe itself could be self aware do you understand this is self aware so at this moment i will not take this universe it is too big for us to think but let us come to planet earth our planet earth is a living being we know this but is it conscious the way we are conscious is our planet earth self aware just as we are self aware this is the question scientists are today coming to the conclusion that planet earth is not only a living being it is conscious and it is self aware they are not yet sure they are just thinking and it is in that context i will teach the bhagavad gita 5000 years ago all these things were absolutely known to the indian culture and the answer is yes it is conscious and it is self aware just as i am aware i am this and i am different from planet earth is self aware and how that is possible we will see from what lord krishna talks in the bhagavad gita but first thing that he is talking about himself this is the fourth chapter those of you are studying bhagavad gita from the first chapter second chapter third chapter lord krishna is giving a teaching he is behaving like a normal human being a normal teacher a normal guru and he is trying to give his advice in the second chapter third chapter but in the fourth chapter he changes the topics a little bit and starts talking about himself and there in that the first verse is very beautiful fourth chapter sixth verse ajo pi san ajo pi san abhyatma he is using two words and he is saying look arjun look i am basically somebody who is unborn i am basically somebody who is unborn i am somebody who doesn't change doesn't change doesn't decay doesn't deteriorate that means i am also imperishable and i don't die i am unborn i am undying and i am the lord of the universe sarva bhutanam ishvaro pisan sarva bhutanam ishvaro pisan i am the lord of the universe if a human being talks like this what can what will you think of that human being i am the lord of the universe today we know the universe has billions of galaxies 
And if a human being says, I am the Lord of the universe, how does it feel? <laughs> so now, then he says, I am the Lord of the universe. And but I myself, according to my own laws, I put myself within my own laws and come down as a human being. You get this point? What is he saying? I am the Lord of the universe. I am beyond all laws. Although I am beyond all laws, I put myself under my own laws, which I myself created. I put myself under those laws and come down as a human being. And then the question comes, why do you come down? What is your need? These are very beautiful. And considering the time that we are living, this is very important. Yada yada hi dharmasya glani rbhavati bharata. Yada yada hi dharmasya glani rbhavati bharata. Abhyutthanam adharmasya tadatmanam sriyamyam. One verse followed by Paritranaya sadhunam vinashaya chadushkritam. Dharma Sansthapanarthaya Sambhavami Yuge. These two verses in the Bhagavad Gita is quoted in my country. Thousands of people will be sitting in audiences and these two verses are repeated. Very meaningful. Krishna says, I come down. Why? Whenever in any culture, any society, any nation, any country, whenever dharma, dharma, righteousness, moral values, whenever moral values, righteousness declines and unrighteousness, adharma, unrighteousness, things which are evil nature, increase. That time I come down and I do what? Paritranaya sadhuna. I protect the good. I destroy the evil. Protect the good, destroy the evil, and restore. Restore dharma. Restore the balance between dharma and adharma. Restore the balance between good and bad. I don't completely destroy the bad. He didn't say, I completely destroy the bad. He said, he says, I restore the balance between good and bad. What does it mean? That on this planet Earth, we cannot have everything good, 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 good. If we have everything good, good, and if we make this planet Earth a heaven, what will happen? It will not solve the purpose for which we are born here. There has to be a mixture of good and bad. But when evil becomes too strong and normal good people tend to suffer because of few people who have become strong and evil and trying to, trying to do the wrong things in any society and average people are suffering, that time a divine power comes down <coughs> to help protect the good and destroy. Yeah, what do you want to ask? We have divine power coming down. Right <laughs> <now>. <laughs> <laughs> we have to invoke that divine power. It's up to us. Uh, it's up to us. <laughs> he doesn't always. decide. We have to invoke so strongly, so earnestly, so longingly. My Lord, send your power. Either you come or send your power because we are in a difficult moment. You come, my Lord, come, my Lord, come, my Lord. Just a wishful thinking doesn't do anything. That is where we have to play our role. A wishful idea, oh, God should come, oh, this is bad. We have to do our very best. We have to do our very best to strengthen the good, to neutralize the bad. We have to do our part. We have to go out of our way to do our part. And after having done the part, then when I say, my Lord, now come, he will come. But if we don't do our part, if we sit quietly asking him to come and do all the work, it will not happen. 
So we have to understand how to invoke a divine power, whether it is in my own personal life or a community life or a social life, I have to go out of my way. I have to discriminate in my mind who is my good leader and who is not my good leader. And if I don't know how to discriminate, then God will not come to help. So whenever something is going wrong in a society, we have to learn to discriminate ourselves. He has given us the power of Vivek that find out what type of leader and what type of policies are good for you. Find out that. Be clear. Do your best to get that. And then when you find the evil power is too strong for you and you are not being able to do, then invoke the divine power and the divine power will come. But this particular chapter I am reading to make you understand it is because of this that we Hindus, we Hindus can immediately accept Moses, Jesus, Buddha, Prophet Muhammad, everybody as an incarnation of God. Because Krishna says from time to time, from age after age, in any place, wherever there is a adharma coming up, unrighteousness coming up, I come to protect. So from our point of view, all these Jesus, Moses, Muhammad, they all become incarnations of God. They all came at a particular historical time in a particular society to stop something bad and restore the good. And that is one aspect which other religions have to, have to accept. And nobody should claim that ours is the only path and our is the only thing that has to completely go. This is a very beautiful understanding. And when is Krishna giving this teaching? When is Krishna giving this teaching? What is the historical date? Whenever I have somebody new face, I always bring up this because history, we have to know. The past, we have to know. We have to get the benefit of the past in the present moment to change. So what is the time when he is giving the teaching? 5,000 years ago. Always remember this. 5,000 years ago, he is giving the teaching. None of the major religions are existing at that time. And he is saying, I come down from time to time. Clear? Now the next point. The next point I will come on is the story of creation, the story of evolution, and certain things connected with those ideas. Today I will just start off. I will just start off that. Whenever I use the word creation, in English, the word creation, what does it mean, the word creation? Creation, the word universe, I will use it as if they are, as if they are synonymous. So creation or universe, whenever I use, it is synonymous. And the Indian term, the term that Krishna is using is prakriti, prakriti, for you. A yoga person, huh? and, and we have to now start defining these terms. Before I define, now what is Krishna saying? Sarva bhutani kontiya prakitim yanti mamikam kalpakshay punastani kalpato visvijamya. Beautiful verse. 5,000 years ago, somebody is saying that this whole universe. This whole universe I create and there is a time factor called Kalpa. Kalpa, you also know this Kalpa, yeah? Kalpa is a time period which the universe is created and the universe lasts for a period of a Kalpa. That time period is a big time period, big calculation and the calculation is the universe is created and lasts for a period of Kalpa and when that time period is over, then what happens to the universe? Hmm. This universe, which now we are studying billions of galaxies, we are seeing galaxies are floating around. The universe is expanding. The universe has been created. It is maintained for a particular period of time. And then what happens? Huh? And what does that dissolved mean? Yeah, that's a very beautiful word you have used, dissolved. What does that word dissolved mean? Goes back to that original 
cause from which it was created. Huh? That is not, that we don't know. Because this idea of expansion of the universe that modern scientists are coming out, how accurate is, we don't know. This teaching is that the universe is created. How it is created, it will come later. It is created. It is maintained for a particular period of time. And in, during that process, the universe can expand. Just like a seed, a seed is growing into a tree, the tree is expanding. So the universe may expand, but after a particular time period, it is resolved back into its original cause. So the universe itself is cyclic in creation. This idea of modern science doesn't have at the moment. Modern science. Well, huh? but, but, you know, this idea of the cyclic creation is, is back in science. Certain yes, it is coming. Today. It is coming. As on today, as on today, modern science is saying that this physical universe has been created 13.7 billion years ago, and the universe is at the moment expanding. But what will happen to the universe? It is still not very clear. Well, some, some, some open-minded, no, no. some, some open-minded, yeah. Oh. yeah, open-minded. So here it is clear to us that the universe itself goes through a cyclic creation and dissolution. Creation and dissolution. Now the whole universe, if it is going through, then the Indian culture also in certain other parts, every part of this universe also goes through a cyclic creation. Every part will mean a galaxy. A galaxy will be created. It will be maintained for a particular period. It will be dissolved. Our solar system, our solar system, sun and the planets, they have been created. It is getting maintained. The, the whole solar system will someday get dissolved. Planet Earth, it has been created. It is getting maintained. Someday the whole planet Earth will get dissolved. When planet Earth gets dissolved, what happens to us? Huh? No, I want you to understand this concept, these ideas are so beautiful. Let us keep the mind open. In moments of stress, <laughs> whenever I am unhappy, if I ever become unhappy, you know what I do? I start thinking of the bigger picture. The more bigger picture you start thinking of, all the unhappiness just goes up. My heart becomes very happy and peaceful. So, I will come to this. But when planet Earth, planet Earth gets dissolved, what happens to human beings? Huh? Are you finished? No. This is the point. Our body will get definitely fried up. Body. The body, <laughs> body will get drowned in a tsunami. Huh? Or the body will simply get burnt off. But the body gets burnt off. We don't get burnt off. The soul and the astral body, where will it go? It will stay here only. The physical dimension is getting created. The astral body stays here only. When another planet becomes ready for life, what will happen? The souls will again start coming back. to this. So, the physical dimension is created, maintained and dissolved. And there's a record of all of these iterations? You see, the human beings cannot keep a historical record of all these things. No human beings can keep a record. But sometimes, sometimes divine beings, divine beings, they can read the Akashic record and they can see how the civilizations are come and gone. But a record of everything is available in the Akashic record, in space. Everything is recorded in space, what is called Akashic record. Now modern people are getting to know, everybody here also in America we know, and there's a record of everything, and a video recording of everything. Every civilization, how it came up, how it went down, there will be a record. Those who can see that record, they will see how it came up, how it came down. The causes for its falling, they can see and record. Our Mahabharata, our Puranas has been written like this by a master who can see these records, and they have recorded so beautiful stories of civilization coming and going. You wanted to ask something? Yes. Um, so in this dissolution period, uh, 
Do we maintain our identity, M I N identity, as a soul, and it is still present at that time? Yeah. Yes. You maintain the soul can never get destroyed, even your astral body, your energetic body that you have. I don't know how much so you know. It doesn't join a universal consciousness, it remains an identity. You maintain an identity, but you also know that you are one with everything. Oneness and individual identity both simultaneously are maintained. Difficult to intellectually understand. Yeah. Whenever I am in a body, moment my soul enters a body, then I feel, when I identify myself with the body, then I feel I am different from everybody else. But when this body has gone and the soul is in an astral body, it will know that I am one with everything. It will have that knowledge, I am one with everything. Also, it will know I am one unique aspect of God. I am not different from God. I am one unique aspect absolutely everybody is a unique aspect of god that is why we don't have to compare ourselves to anybody so our uniqueness our identity stays but this feeling that i am separate from you i'm different that goes so both simultaneously goes some people will say that you merge in such a way that your identity goes some people talk like this, but I have gone through many, many things. So from my point of view, the understanding is the soul knows its oneness with God, but it maintains an individual identity, unique of its own and both simultaneously. But moment that soul enters the physical dimension and the physical body, it starts thinking that I am different from everybody else. Okay, now we come to the next uh, subject and this subject I will keep on discussing. Lord Krishna is now saying, I have got, he's saying I am God and then he's saying I have three nature, a lower nature, a higher nature and a supreme nature. I am God, I am one, but I have three very clear cut aspects of my being. Lower, higher, supreme. That supreme I will not touch today at all. Just the definition of lower and higher. So he says my lower. Lower also means, the word lower means manifested nature. God who is not manifested and God as manifested at the universe. So he says my lower nature and this lower nature is called Prakriti. That word Prakriti, some people use the word Shakti. Shakti, Prakriti, means the whole universe. And for those of you who are into yoga life, know that when we talk of Prakriti or Shakti, it means that primordial, original, homogeneous energy, the first energy. And when we say energy, energy is of also of different, different types. Electricity, gravitation, different types. But that first original, homogeneous, undifferentiated energy, that is what we call Prakriti Shakti. And then that energy will undergo transformations to create this big vast material universe. So now what is Krishna saying? He's saying my energy, my lower aspect has got eightfold differentiation. That means the whole big vast universe and my physical personality, this body, is made out of eight things, of which that eight things, first five, earth, water, fire, air, space. These are called five elements in nature. This is very common knowledge, 
wherever you go in india we always talk of that the body is made out of five elements everything in this universe wherever you go whichever part of the universe you go the universe is always made out of five elements and we hindus will never make it four we hindus will never make it six the whole world can say six four ten twelve hundred we hindus will never change this that my body and everything in the universe is made out of five fundamental energies elements there are eight the eight i will see but first five so what are these five elements earth water fire air and space now what are these elements called this is a little technical for those of you who have a little scientific mind i am trying to clarify what do we actually mean by earth water fire air space what do we mean by earth we know earth matter we know water we know fire but in in the science of yoga where we have made that this whole big vast universe wherever you go and my body is made out of five elements how did we come to that five elements this is something i want you to become aware of how did we come to this five elements okay i will huh i'm not sure if it's the question of how we how came we came to the for example modern science talks of 135 elements 140 elements because they are making the elements based on atomic number so from the scientific point of view elements i think as on today is about 140 150 in future it's likely to increase that is their way of defining elements what is that method by which the hindu masters the ancient rishis made the elements what is that process they used to classify the elements so that it it came to five and it will never be four never be six never be anything else why five because according to the nature there is a greater qualities within ourselves so taking it from quality qualities okay well, that is one anybody else that is why while guess okay now i will tell you the hindu masters consider this body this body as microcosm my human personality is microcosm and the whole big universe is macrocosm you understand these words then they say that whatever is out there in the macrocosm is there in here in the microcosm and whatever is here in the microcosm is out there do you understand this principle so they didn't have to study the galaxies with telescopes they studied the body the mind and the soul they studied body mind and soul and by studying the body they got to know the laws of nature by studying the mind they got to know all the laws of the higher dimensions and by studying the soul they got to know what god is so they studied the body now when we study the body how many senses we have got huh five now what is a sense organ let us try to understand sense organ for example my eyes eyes are a sense organ what is this eyes doing what is the function that the eyes are doing the whole universe is one big ocean of energy this we know it's the universe is big vast ocean of energy this energy is of different different types different different frequencies different different wavelengths energies are of different type and i am in that ocean of energy what is my eyes doing huh a particular frequency of light vibration my eyes are taking do you understand this a particular range of energy my eyes are picking up and we are calling that light 
a certain range of energy that my eyes can pick up. That is what we are calling light. That is one element. So when we say element, element means certain frequency, certain range of energy that my sense organs can pick up. Are you getting this idea? You have to get this idea. So my eyes can pick up a particular range of energy. We call that light vibration. What about the ear? What energy the ear is picking up? So certain energy frequency the ear is picking up and we have given the name as sound. Shabda. I have given all this in, 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 the, in the script. The ear picks up sound. We don't say sound, we say shabd. Shabd means sound. The skin, the skin is an organ, sense organ. What does this skin pick up? It picks up certain amount of vibration, certain type of vibration. What name can we give that? Huh? Touch. So there are words like that in Sanskrit and in English. So in English, it is touch. Then my tongue, my tongue is a sense organ. My tongue can, is also picking up certain, certain vibrations. What do we give name to that? Huh? Taste. And then my nose is picking up certain vibration. What do we say? Smell. So five sense organs are picking up five types of energies. And these five types of energies in the Hindu philosophy has been named as Tanmatra. Tanmatra. This is a word which you will find in yoga, hmm? in Vedanta. Huh? Uh, so today you must know what is a Tanmatra. Tanmatra means a subtle energy which will give rise to the grosser energies. This is absolutely a sign. There is no belief systems here. Modern science is coming out in one way and this ancient science came out in another way. So when we say five elements, why are we saying five elements? Why are we classifying all the energy in the world as five? Because we have only five organs to pick up. If suddenly somebody has a sixth organ, then what will this science will become? It will become six elements. I will come to that. I will uh, just a little bit. Huh? I will come to that. So is this point clear? I'm making it so that you absorb. In meditation, you have to start thinking a little bit. Start contemplating. It is a scientific approach. I am a human being. From the human being point of view, I am staying in a vast infinite ocean of energy. Hmm? And this infinite ocean of energy has different frequency, I know. Different wavelengths, I know densities of energy, out of that, my five sense organs are picking up five different types of energies. And those five different types of energies are the stun matras. Stun matra means subtle energy which will give rise to gross energy. Clear so far? Now these five energies that my nose, my eyes are picking up, those energies they have a combination and the Indian culture says a process of quintuplication. It is a science, a process of quintuplication. Five, uh, the, those five elements, they intermix with each other, creating this earth that we see, this water that we see, this fire that we see. It is a mixture of those five subtle energies combined together. Is becoming too much, too technical? Okay. When so, they mix, that's why they will, will, like we can see fire and feel fire. That's why they've mixed. So they, it'll do two of our senses. It will all, the five sense, all the five okay. senses. All the five senses. Okay. So if you, if you don't understand, nice to see you. Come, come. Okay. Huh? 
You, you can smell Every, fire. Everything you can smell in fire. the material universe everything is all five senses. Yes, yes. And that is how Krishna will come later on. And I will add. So, so this thing try to understand now. Huh? We can see sound. We, we can see sound. We can see sound not with these two eyes, but sound can be seen. Mm -hmm. And light can be heard. Oh, yeah. Huh? Now it's getting interesting. All the senses, yes. Wow. Yeah. Light vibrations, not only we see, it can be heard. And sound vibrations can be seen when the senses are. So this is a very big science. And since we are all meditating, and since we are all having different types of Kundalini experiences, we will have. So many, many experiences will come. And then this theory will explain many things. And if we don't know the theory, then some of our spiritual experiences we don't understand. So whatever I am explaining, I will keep repeating. And then in the second, I will keep on repeating this. I want these ideas in your mind to go. Understand it, what is the idea? So now, my ears are picking up a particular vibration. My eyes are picking up certain other vibration. So five types of vibrations I am picking up. Out of these five types of vibration, which vibration is subtle and which is the grossest? I want you to understand this. I just told you my five senses picks up five types of vibration. The sound, the nose picks up smell. Out of these five, which is the subtlest vibration and which is the grossest vibration? I want you to answer, if somebody can. If you, huh? The <laughs> okay, the okay. The, the sound of, the sound vibration is the subtlest vibration and the smell vibration is the grossest vibration. And in that order, it will come down. The smell is the grossest vibration. Now, this earth element that we see, this earth element, we know what is earth, this earth or matter. This earth element is made by 50% of that smell vibration and 10% of the other vibrations the earth element is made. What's the other 40% of earth? Huh? What's the other 40% of earth? 10% of, uh, light, 10% of uh, light, 10% of uh, I see. 10% of uh, other see. four I elements. So earth see. element has 50% yeah. of smell uh -huh. and 10% of the other out of those five. So when matter is changing forms, like an animal is rotting, uh -huh. we, we, it creates smell. When matter, earth, is uh -huh. changing forms, uh -huh. smell is produced. Okay, smell is released. Yeah, released. smell is yeah, released or smell so is produced. So even like we, we uh, eat food, when uh, we secrete the uh, food, uh, we create smell. Oh, because interesting. So Forms matter too. has maximum smell vibration. Okay. Matter has maximum smell vibration. Is there a range of smell vibrations? Like is a rose smell higher than uh, decaying smell? Yeah, there will be. When we, if we start observing the different types of smells, we will definitely, there will be a gradation. But now I'm just giving the general principle rain. So the point that I'm trying to bring out today is that anything that is of a material nature, what we call matter in science, that matter has most of the vibration is connected with smell. And then what happens? Then in this chapter, Krishna goes on to say, Krishna will go on to say a little bit. Punyo Gandha Prithivyam. That is a beautiful statement. Punyo Gandha Prithivyam. I am the smell in the earth element. He makes that statement. I am the smell in the earth element. That earth element has got more smell. So now, now please think. Every time I lift a flower, Flower is material in nature, a flower, and I am smelling it. What am I doing? Contacting God. I am contacting God. God cannot be in the clouds. If I make God coming in the clouds, sitting somewhere in the clouds, that God has no meaning. Krishna says, I am the smell in the earth element. 
which means every time I smell a flower, I smell this flower, what am I doing? I am experiencing God as smell. Every time I take a fruit and smell it, every time there is a rain on this earth and the earth comes out with a beautiful smell, that smell, Punyo Gandha Prithivyam, Krishna says, that smell of the earth element is what I am. So, huh? so when we talk of experiencing God, knowing God, understanding God, if we know what God is, then we know in how many different ways every day we are experiencing Him without knowing that we are experiencing Him. Even in the unpleasant smell. That unpleasant spell, we will not take it at the moment because that will disturb. But let us take the pleasant smell. Okay. But yes, he is in the unpleasant smell. And the masters, what they have done, they have converted that unpleasant smell also as something which is very, very divine. Because he is there in all smell, the good and the bad. But for us, let us stick to the good smell first okay. and enjoy that good smell. Good smell, I am smelling. And that is why, that is why all these offerings are done. Offering. God is in smell. Oh, incense. Incense, flowers, fruits. I am, I am offering this because that is part of God. That is holy. That is sacred. So sacred is not just something. Everything is sacred. And this is a very beautiful understanding. I am there in the matter as smell. You get this idea? Then allow, ah, yes. yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm, nice. yeah. In that Shiva mantra, in the Shiva mantra, um, Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Su, Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Su Gandhim. Sugandhim means you are of beautiful smell. So all these words from the mantras, you will understand if you know the theory. So he's saying in the material dimension, what we call earth element, in the earth element, I am the smell. Then again, he goes on to say in the water element, in the water element, what? Raso hamap sukantiya, raso hamap sukantiya, ras, ras means that water element, which the tongue is picking up, taste. I am the taste in the water element. I am the taste in the water element. So now again, when I taste a good food, what am I tasting? When I am enjoying a tasty food, whether it is a fruit, whether it is a dish, I am enjoying a tasty food. What am I enjoying? Huh? I am enjoying an aspect of God. So God is not just in my meditation. In different, different aspects, God can be enjoyed. God can be, if we know how God is manifesting, the whole universe, everything is God. But that is his lower nature. He has a higher nature. He has a supreme nature. We'll come later on. But now we are talking of the lower nature, which is formed of five elements, earth, water, fire, air. And in that five elements, he's talking of, I am the smell in the, in the earth element. I am the taste in the water element. And one more point, he will say, Prabhas me Shachi Suryo. I am the light in the sun and the moon. So when we look into the sun and we say, oh, today is such a good day. We just say such a good day. So we say sun god, moon god. We always talk of sun god, moon god because that is where God is coming to us or manifesting in front of us as light, light which my eyes can pick up. Are you getting the understanding what I'm trying to, huh? what I'm trying to say? How do I experience God in all aspects? He's there everywhere. I have to know and I have to learn to experience. 
So next time, every time I take a take a take take a apple or a fruit or a flower and smell it, smell it. I should be thankful and happy that God is coming to me in that form of smell. Smell. That smell is God. That is a vibration that will heal me. That can heal me. Today we know aromatherapy is coming up in the whole. Aromatherapy is coming. And this aromatherapy has been known in Indian culture thousands of years ago. In Indian culture, there is a tradition that whenever there is a saintly person, saintly person, you offer a flower garland. Flower garland. Why do we offer a flower garland? Do you know this? Do you know this? That we offer a flower garland to a particular saint. You go to meet a saint, you have to offer a flower garland. Tradition tells us like that. Why? Because, <laughs> because the flower garland is there. It smells. It will make that guru very good. Guru will give me a blessing. Guru will give me a blessing. He will get energized because of the flower garland. Good smell is coming on to his. Huh? He will get energized. Then he will give a blessing. Blessing to me. These are the reason why we do certain things. We also say when you go to a guru, not only give a flower garland, but also offer some good fruits. Just a minute. And this is where Westerners sometimes make mistakes. I have also made mistake. Never make that mistake. She doesn't make that mistake. She's very good. I, I know her very well. Whenever you offer something to the altar, that offering has to be of the very best type. Whether it is flower, whether it is fruit, whether it is anything, you offer the very best to the altar. Why? Altar means you are giving it to gurus, you are giving it to God, you are giving it to those people. So, huh? If I offer which is not good, then what will happen? <laughs> because what I offer is what I will get back. What I give out to the people is what I get back. So if I offer things, in Indian culture, sometimes when people donate, they donate that note, you know, the dollar notes, notes which are absolutely gone crumpled, notes which are torn, sometimes people donate those notes in India. Now, if you donate things like that, no benefit will come. <laughs> the notes, everything that we offer, whether to a guru, to a saint, to an altar, a temple, whatever you offer, you don't have to offer much. Whatever you offer has to be of the best time. Krishna says, Oh my devotees, Patram Pushpam Phalam Toyam Yo Me Bhaktya Prayachati I don't need too much of you. I have everything. I am God. I have everything. Patram Pushpam Phalam Toyam you just offer me one flower, one fruit. And even if that you can't, just give me one drop of water. I'll be happy. But as long as you do that with your love and you do that, what you give has to be of a good quality. If it is not of a good quality, what will happen? What I will get back as against that will not be of a good quality. What I give is what I get. Any questions so far before I move on? Yeah. So when we're in meditation and we, you know, sometimes you have those smells and you're like, oh, sweet smell. Is that still in the lower nature? Or if you don't have anything to smell and then you smell the sweetness or you hear the vibration, is that really the middle of the nature versus the lowest? Very beautiful question. So the smell is not only in the material dimension, the smells are also in the higher subtle dimension. So when we meditate, sometimes when you can smell something very beautiful, you are not exactly smelling the smell of the physical earth. You are smelling something from the astral dimension. That is bringing us up in the middle of the, yes. not the lower, but a little bit higher. Little bit higher. Mm -hmm. little bit. So sometimes in meditation, especially those people who will meditate on the first chakra, the first chakra is the where the earth element is created. 
So meditating on the first chakra, many beautiful smells can be, many beautiful smells. And in our Indian tradition, we say the nose, this nose, this organ of nose is connected with the first chakra. So the first thing in med deep meditation is you will be able to smell many things. Then will come sounds, then will come light, everything comes. Hmm? Which one will come in front? That depends on, uh, on different, different people. But many beautiful smells can be heard. And those perfumes are better than any perfume in Paris. That smell is so beautiful. If you can, the subtle smells, sometimes you may be, uh, many people, I have smelled it, many beautiful smells which are not there. Sounds which are so beautiful. And we wake up and you say, I, I used to, when I used to hear them, I used to think it is coming from some place. I will go around to find out where is the sound coming. Then I realize, no, the sounds are inside. Beautiful sound. So sound, smell, colors, forms, not only of the physical dimension, from the astral dimension also we pick up them. And those astral dimension when we pick up, they are very sweet, they are very beautiful. So what you explained about the senses and smell, mm -hmm. to me, explains why we have this desire to be in nature yes. so much, or a beautiful garden, mm -hmm. right? Now you, you see, you t now you tell me, now you answer the question yourself, yeah. why that tendency is to go out into nature, yeah. into a garden, we always feel good, uplifting, uplifting. Yeah. because in this, huh? Closer to God. You are closer to God. You are closer to God. And the moment you sit in a hall like this, you become yeah. Yeah. You go out and everything will be there. That is why nature is healing. That is why aroma therapy is healing. Sound therapy is coming. All these therapies are coming because they are all healing. And none of these therapies are required. It is all becoming required because we human beings have closed ourselves in this four world. And if we move outside the four walls, no therapy is required. Nature herself will know how to heal us. So what we call civilization is actually not a civilization. We think we are civilized, but we are not. We are cutting ourselves from all that beautiful nature has to offer. So this is actually a backward movement in wisdom and knowledge and not a forward movement. So we have to understand, we have to get back to nature. I'm happy. I thought that people will not be able to understand, but this class is enlightened, huh? Good. I mean. huh. um, in this discussion of Krishna describing himself as the lower nature, mm -hmm. you only talked about the smell, the taste, and the light. Yes. Is there the other, sound, other, other things there also the other things are also there. So he is not only the smell, he is the taste, he is in the form. With the eyes we see light, yeah. and light brings form. So God is in that form. He will come to that also. He is in the sound also. So, so all, yeah. all five. Yeah, all five. And if we read that seventh chapter, you will see. And then he goes on to say, he goes on to say, What is the eyes form and not blind? Hmm? Why, why does he say eyes is form? Why is it not light? Ears, sounds, things touch, eyes is born. Yeah, eyes is always, um, eyes is rupa, we say rupa. Yeah, light, mm -hmm. we don't say light, we say rupa because eyes gives us, through the medium of light, we are seeing the forms. So they could have used the word light, why they chose the word form, I also not very clear, I will think now because you have asked this question, but form, form. And what we see, certain forms are divine in nature. That is why form means a human body, animal body, body of a tree, these are forms. And that is why the Indian culture has made practically every form sacred, sacred. For example, how many things are sacred in, in, in our Indian culture? How many things are holy? What are the things holy in Indian culture? Anybody knows? Cow is holy. So one for anything else, anything else. It's not just cow. Mm -hmm. 
We have elephant holy. We have elephant. Why Ganesh? Elephant holy. We make snakes holy. Snakes holy. We make peacock holy. We have made rivers holy. We have made mountains holy. We have made trees holy. Stones. Huh? Huh? Stones. <laughs> stones. We have not yet said stones. Crystals. <laughs> yeah, yeah, crystals. Yeah, matter crystal. Crystal, gold, huh? gold. Um, so we have made many things holy. Why have we made this? Because we have known that God is in everything, but whatever things are beneficial to me, helpful to me, uplifts me, strengthens me, heals me, those things we have made it specifically holy. How many of you know that basil is considered holy? Tulsi. Tulsi. Basil is considered holy in Indian culture. Now you tell me what is the benefit of basil? B-A-S-I-L, basil. Huh? It's a herb for all cold and cough. Tulsi is the best remedy. Any amount of cold, cough, sneezing, blockages in the Tulsi with a little ginger, little ginger is the best solution. Many of these herbs, we have completely lost control. All this cancer that is taking place, much of this cancer can be reduced. I can't say gone, but reduced. If we know some of the herbs which makes the body anti-cancerous. How many of you know haldi? Haldi means turmeric. Turmeric. All of you know turmeric? Turmeric is a herb which is there in every Indian food. Dal, lentils, vegetables, turmeric. That turmeric is anti-cancerous property. Anti -inflammatory. Huh? Anti-inflammatory, yes. Turmeric. So a study about these herbs and their properties will and we can, and what we say, you don't have to go to the doctors, home remedies. In Ayurveda, there is a whole chapter of home remedies. For every small little sickness or big sickness, there is a home remedy. We say grandmother's tonic, grandmother's wisdom. But we have forgotten all those things. And so the, all these things are coming up. Swamiji, mm. you were talking about the Christmas and holidays that we don't bring spirit into. And she was talking about how you will have smell when you actually smell something material, but then you will also maybe have a smell when there is no material thing present. So we're talking about the, the, the layers, right? And so I think also about plant medicine, I think about, we, we often associate like herbs and whatnot with just the enjoyment of taste. We've lost that spiritual connection that even if you know turmeric is anti-inflammatory, you don't bring that spiritual sense, mm. that respect and that reverence, even its healing property cannot be maximized. This point is also true. This point is true. Sometimes that healing herbs, if we don't create a sacredness behind that healing herb, it will not have its best benefit. So everything has to be treated very well Considered it sacred. Considered it sacred. And in my Indian culture, I will give you examples of saints. I will give one example of how people make sacred in Indian culture. There was a poet saint, a poet saint who was born blind. Somebody who is born blind. He later on became a poet saint and became a very popular teacher in my Indian culture. And he was trying to, trying to print this Bhagavad Gita. He was making an effort to print the Bhagavad Gita. So to print the Bhagavad Gita, what are the things are required? Paper, ink, and, uh, and the persons who were involved, the persons who were involved in making the paper, cutting the paper, chipping the paper, printing the paper, all these people were made you know, they were made to do what? Get up at four o'clock in the morning. They were made to take a bath, holy bath, clean the body, clean the dress, clean food, and then come, come and do this work, do this work. That is how the sacredness, the sanctity is to be built up to behind the best benefit. That is why we say whenever you eat food, whenever you eat food, any food, what is the first thing you have to do? 
whenever you are eating food huh offer it to god first offer it to god by offering the food to god my lord this is a gift you have given me but before i take it i am offering it to you you bless that take god's blessing take the guru's blessing angelic blessing and then you can yourself bless you can yourself bless by your own energy but you have to make that food very sacred when somebody is cooking the food in a good ashram in the good ashram when somebody is cooking food you know what do they do om namah shivaya om namah shivaya om they keep on chanting the cook the people who are, they keep on chanting when they are cooking the food why to make that food sacred sacred clean pure when somebody is cooking a husband uh, uh, here i will say uh, any any cook in my indian culture we say when women cook we say mothers cook food is the best food in the whole world she cooks whether it has carbohydrates whether it has proteins whether it has mineral salt we just damn care whatever mother has cooked is the best food in the world why do we say and you have to see you have to go to the slums in india you go to the slums the children are more healthy and happy than all these people here the food is cooked with love that love vibration makes that food more better then all the carbohydrates and minerals they will lose their power if there is no sanctity and sacredness so when we read this chapter again and again in indian culture when we read this chapter again and again that then it brings up a very sacred feeling towards all things around i cannot dislike my dislikes will dissolve my biases will dissolve because i start seeing god feeling god in everything everything and on top of that if we read this he says buddhir buddhi matam asmi buddhir buddhi matam asmi he is saying i am the intelligent of the intelligent people i am the intelligence of the intelligent people now what does that mean now so if i have some intelligence let us say what does this statement mean i am the intelligence of the intelligent people ha huh? he's within all of us we can all I, have some can i take any pride for the intelligence that i have no, no. <laughs> because the intelligence that i have is not mine that intelligence has come to me because he has given it to me and he is sitting inside of me as my intelligence my intelligence is not mine so what pride can i take what ego can i have if i know today that whatever intelligence i have that intelligence is not mine not mine ha huh? no it you cannot have when you understand these things properly you cannot have all your talents all the talents that we have each one of us we have some talent all the talents that we have these talents are coming from is gift to us it is not ours and if we once get to know how can we have this ego rising that i am this i am that i am i am doing this i am doing that so every time we read this bijam mam sarva bhutanam vidhi parth sanatanam buddhir buddhi matam asmi tejas tejas vinah and if you are brilliant in something if you are brilliant then that brilliance is i am there as the brilliance if you are strong if you are strong that strength is i am so with this seventh chapter if we study every day correctly understanding all our ego that i have worked so hard this is my quality i have cultivated this is my strength all those things goes and spiritual people then we become spiritual just by reading a bible reading a bhagavad gita just by reading we don't become saintly but once we understand with the understanding and start reading then we definitely become saint one yeah you want to ask something yeah. so when you you talked at extent about the uh, five elements now we're talking about the ego and the mind mm -hmm. i will talk about the 
Okay. Go through that. Okay. Okay. We'll stick to that a little bit. So five elements we have seen. Five elements, and the seventh, eighth, ninth element was manas, buddhi, and ahanka. Manas, buddhi, and ahanka. Now manas means in human being, manas means that part of the mind, that thinking mind. What we generally say, thinking mind. and the mind that is coordinating the sense activities the senses are bringing this data and the senses activity has to be coordinated manas is that and buddhi buddhi means that intelligence that intelligence which is making me making me distinguish between what is good for me what is not good for me discriminative intelligence is called buddhi normal thinking that is going on is manas and discriminative understanding discriminative intelligence is what is called buddhi and what is ahankar what is ahankar it is translated as ego please know the western idea of ego and the indian idea of ego there is a big difference and if you don't understand then your wishy wishy thinking wishy washy the in the western idea of ego ego is always negative because ego is a selfish self centered idea of the mind it is always negative egoistic ego action free thing in the indian culture that word ego is not correct that word is ahankar 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 means there is something in my mind which is telling me that i am this body that is called ahanka something in my mind which is telling me i am not all this i am just this body i am this that is called ahanka and i am different from others ahankar is that factor in the mind which makes me feel i am this body and i am different from others it creates that separation it creates that division so in my personality in my personality my body is made out of those five elements earth water fire i have a mind i have a intelligence and i have this ahankar so because of that ahankar i feel that i am this and i am not all this i am separate i am different so that ahankar has to be neutralized it has to be neutralized or that has to be expanded sometimes we say ahankar has to be neutralized and sometimes we say it has to be expanded expanded means i am not this i am all this that is called expansion so aham this now tell me this planet earth planet earth everything in the universe is made out of these eight elements everything in the universe is made out of this eight element <coughs> i am made out of it everything is made out of planet earth is also made out of these eight elements will planet earth have self? ego means self awareness ego also means self awareness self awareness i am aware of me as separate and different that is ego ego creates self awareness and the definition of self also the false self we Not don't self yeah the uh, self with the small self small self we don't say false we say the lower self because this lower self is also part of me but it is my lower self lower self and and sometimes people will always use this false self pseudo self people are using this word but it is basically my lower self it is not false it is not wrong it is just my lower self and i must attune myself to the highest you can be you can have self awareness without concluding that you're separate though right then when you have that then then that That's self, the self. Huh? then then your mind is dominated by the higher thing higher self <clears throat> where was i i forgot oh. <laughs> 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 so now one more point i want to bring because of this everything is formed out of earth elements so this planet earth this whole planet earth with whatever it is is it 
a self aware being or is it just with no awareness what is the answer to this question from this point of view when krishna says everything everything has got earth water fire even the rocks rocks are made of earth water fire will be there air will be there space will be there mind is mind there in the rocks ha huh? yes it will be there only the degree so mind is there in the rocks but the degree is less the mind is more in the vegetable kingdom it is still more in the animal kingdom it is still more in the human kingdom but in everything there is this earth water fire air space mind manas buddhi ahankar so planet earth is it a self aware planet yes or no answer is yes then planet earth then take the sun that big huge ball of fire modern science is calling it a ball of fire radiating energy is that ball of fire only a ball of fire or is it a being self aware being ha huh? it is a self aware being that being is what the hindus worship sun god we are not worshiping just that ball of fire we are we know that ball of fire is a living conscious self aware being but are minerals self aware are rocks and stones self they, no they will not have that self awareness because that self awareness is very little in them when it comes up to the animal level certain amount of is there at the human level the self awareness is very small it's so planet level because it has all of those it uh, is high yeah so at a planet level everything is there and they have sun will have the galaxy as a whole unit will have and the whole universe is one entity now when we worship when we hindus worship durga kali what are we worshiping i want you to also understand that the whole universe is considered as a gigantic being intelligent conscious aware now this gigantic being the universe is aware that it is different from whom it is aware of it. ego will create a create a difference i am something different so the whole universe is a gigantic being and this being is different from what different from the creator this being will think i am a different being different from whom from the creator whoever created me so so the whole universe is a gigantic being and that being is what we call the divine mother we are giving a feminine gender because that is the thing which is creating everything so we call divine mother divine mother means the whole universe as a gigantic being and then what do we mean by divine father huh creator that creator who created this whole big vast universe then how do we define that creator who is that creator who is creating what is his nature that is why krishna says krishna's <clears throat> he says my lower nature is made out of this eight elements and my higher nature is consciousness the consciousness that brings intelligence and light principle into this lower nature so forget about the universe come to the body in my human personality my human personality is made out of those eight elements earth water fire air space in the body mind intelligence what is the higher nature of god which is in me my soul consciousness soul consciousness is in me soul is a unit of consciousness your god so my soul is the higher aspect of god my body mind ego is the lower aspect of god 
but both are aspects of god both are aspects of god one is lower one is higher one more point i want to one more point i want to give today in this today's class and thereafter i will again take on this is at a practical level when we suggest people some spiritual techniques or mantras or whatever when we suggest we have to suggest according to certain idea and the idea is krishna is saying that of all the people who are devotees of god or who are trying to worship god or who are trying to experience god devotees of god he is dividing them under four categories and i want you to know these four categories he is saying chatur bhida bhajante mam sukritin arjuna ar तो जिज्ञासुरर्थार्थी ज्ञानी च भरतर शब्द दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट अमंग एवरीबडी हु इज ट्राइंग टू कॉन्टैक्ट गॉड वर्शिप गॉड लव गॉड पीपल हैव बीन डिवाइडेड इनटू फोर द फर्स्ट कैटेगरी इज कॉल्ड आर्थ आर्थ ए आर टी ए आर्थ व्हाट डज दिस वर्ड मीन आई हैव रिटन हियर Huh? Those who are in distress. People who are in distress. One very good big group of people who are in distress, in a problem, in a difficulty because of sickness, suffering, loss, tragedy. Whenever there is somebody who is trying to now contact God because that person wants support, help, guidance because his or her life is in distress. Stress. So one group of people who are in distress, and when they are given a mantra or there, it has to be taken into view that what are they trying to achieve in their moment of distress? You have to keep that in mind while advising people that when somebody is in distress, we don't have to always advise the same thing to everybody. So one group of people is. distressed people who is the next group of people ha <laughs> people who are wanting power and money now the indian culture doesn't stop anybody from attaining whatever they want those who are wanting power and money is another group of people <coughs> we call we call artharthi people who are wanting more and more power more and more money that wanting more and more power and money is not considered negative it becomes negative but it is not considered negative why why is people wanting power and money money brings power so both are more or less same why are we wanting power some people are wanting power in the form of money in the form of political power in the form of control why are we wanting more and more power ha huh? ha huh? because please no my soul my soul is omnipotent all powerful and my soul is wanting to regain that all powerfulness that is why at the level of my mind i want to have more power more money i think that the power is outside and i am going for money some day after going for all the money in the world i will realize that this external money which i thought is a source of power is not the power that i am wanting what is the power i am wanting the this power outside whatever amount i have will never satisfy me i then that person when the person understands that then that person can be told okay look now that you have understood that this external power is not going to satisfy you now understand that the power that you are looking for is the power of your soul 
But before a person understands this, if you give him a teaching of the power of your soul, do you know what will happen? <laughs> he will not understand. Yes, no. Huh? My, my, my spiritual teacher used to, used to say that Americans are ripe for enlightenment mm -hmm. because we had reached a standard of living that we had aspired to and the whole world aspires to. And we, we were realizing that it wasn't there. It, it just didn't satisfy. And so we were at a point where we realized that and we had to look elsewhere. This is an absolute correct point that unless you have come to the understanding that this external power and money after satisfying fully, when you realize that that doesn't satisfy, then the mind turns inside. So she is right that the whole American culture, after going through that American dream, after going through that dream, they realize that this is not really satisfying. I have all the money, all the house, all the property, all the comforts, all the enjoyment, yet I am not satisfied. A person's mind has to reach that state before that person can come inside. So before I start advising anybody what to do, I have to know that person's character. And for some people, it is good to go outside and collect for some time, till such time they become aware that outside never satisfies then that person will come. Yeah. So do you relate to this concept of um, like demonic deeds? So for example, say somebody like, uh, for me, Donald Trump, and he just wants more money, more money, more money, like destroying natural monuments for more oil and more gas. And, and I think to myself, he already has yachts and estates. How much more money does somebody need? Is this related somehow? It's like an addiction, trying to get more and more and more. It is not just like Donald Trump. Donald Trump is just one example like that. Hundreds of examples in every culture, we will have people like that who are never satisfied with whatever they have. They will not be satisfied. For the simple reason that the soul inside is pushing us towards acquiring more and more. But those people like Donald Trump, they think by acquiring more and more outside, I will become happy. They are ignorant. They don't know that this outside will not satisfy. But they have to come to that realization. And people like Donald Trump have not yet come to the realization. They think more outside will make me more strong, more powerful. They are going outside. And then when they go outside, we can have people like Gandhi and people like Donald Trump. Both are powerful. One is using his power for good. Other is using his power for bad. Why that happens, that will be the subject of the next class when I talk on the gunas. Gunas, rajasik, tamasik, sattvic. Have you heard of this guna? When I talk of these gunas, then you will understand why somebody like Donald Trump is powerful, but he's tamasic in nature. So he goes for demonic nature. And when you cultivate sattvic nature, you become Mahatma Gandhi, you become Dalai Lama, you become Mother Teresa, also powerful, powerful money-wise externally, but they are using it for the right because their energy is sattvic. His energy is tamasi. So that understanding will come when I get to that next class of the gunas. But right now you know that Donald Trump is not wrong. Alexander, what did Alexander do? <laughs> He is just a young boy of 20. He begins and at the age of 31, he dies. What did Alexander want to do in his life? Huh? Conquer the world. And he's conquering. He conquered the Persian Empire, biggest empire of that time. He conquered that. Then he comes to India. He wanted to conquer India. But for some reason, he could not conquer India. He became sick and he could not come back. He was dying. He's just 31. He's dying after conquering half the world within 31, collecting all those money, all that money and wealth of India, of Persia, he collected. And at 31, suddenly he found himself sick and now he is dying. When he realized that he's dying at 31, do you know what order he told his generals? The generals who were around him, what did he tell him? He told him, look, 
when you put my body in the casket, that casket, please keep my hands outside and then carry my body. And or when you are burying my body, let my hands be outside. Now the generals were, they used to love him for whatever reason, they loved him. And now as a young man and after conquering half the world, he's dying. And these generals are grieving, soldiers are grieving. So somebody asks, sir, why this? Why are you wanting the hands to be out like that? It should be kept and it should be done properly. Why do you want the hands outside? <laughs> why did Alexander want the hands to be outside? He <laughs> said, I want it outside because now that I am dying, I am realizing all this wealth that I accumulated through my conquering is not going to go with me. So I want to tell the whole world, look, now I am going to the other world empty-handed. Empty-handed. I cannot carry the wealth with me. I am going empty-handed. So Alexander, after conquering all the world and accumulating all the wealth, realized at the moment of his death that he can't carry this. So now when that Alexander will be reborn, <laughs> with what tendency will he be reborn now? Now he has an experience. That experience will remain in his subconscious mind. And he will be reborn. Reborn somewhere. But what sort of a tendency will he now bring in his next life? Huh? He will bring the tendency that oh, this collecting things outside is no good. This time I will learn to go inside and strengthen my power inside. He will be born with a better spiritual tendency in his next life. Now, whether Donald Trump will be born with that tendency or not? I'm not so sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we are not so sure because his, his mind at the moment is more power, more wealth, more. But unless the mind understands that this outside is not what will satisfy me, till such time the person will not. That is why in our Indian culture, in our Indian culture, as we go through our stories, we will see that many people, strong-willed people, very determined people, we see that they will do tapasya, they will do tapasya, they will stand like this and Om Namah Shiva, Om Namah Shiva, <coughs> Om Namah Shiva, they will keep on chanting, keep on chanting. And then our stories tell us that when, when you are calling on God, God has to today or tomorrow come. So God comes to them in that form, Shiva or Krishna or Rama. And then they ask, my Lord, give me, I want to be immortal. I want not to die. I want to have a body which never dies. This sort of a boon they ask. And many times we see God in the form of Shiva or anybody who came, they had to give that boon to them. Because whatever you strive for, whatever you ask for, you will get. The law of the universe, whatever you are wanting, you will get. Huh? That's scary. Whatever That's you want. No, that is good. That is That's a good scary. If he wants power, if he wants power, the universe will be forced to give him that power. If he does certain things to gain his power for good or bad, the universe is forced to give him that power. And then we read stories that then in the higher heaven, these gods have to make plan how to kill this guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because, because ultimately the guy has to be killed. Because the law is we can't go to heaven with this body. Ultimately. So in our story, in our stories, we have a guy, a demonic guy who, who prayed, my Lord, I don't want to be killed by anything which is outside, anything which is inside, by any man, by any <coughs> animal. I don't want to get killed. I want that boon. So God had to give that boon. Now, moment he got that boon, what does he start doing? He starts misusing that. Misusing, killing, hurting people. Now he wants to be the ruler of the heaven. And then what does the story say? God had to take a form which we call nursing. A man lion, man lion, half animal, half human. He had to take the form. And then this guy will not 
be killed outside he cannot be killed inside he cannot be killed above or below so god had to choose a place where he is standing on the door neither inside nor outside <laughs> <laughs> we have stories like this that in the, in the doorway he had to be killed in the doorway when it is neither day nor night at dusk period <laughs> so he was killed like this we have a story in the ramayana ravana ravana a demon king like modern day many kings are there many ceos are like that he asks for a boon my lord i don't want to be killed by any man or any animal but then he forgot out of that animal he forgot he forgot monkeys no he said i don't want to be killed by animals i don't want to be killed by any any any, any gods and goddesses i don't want to be killed by any power so in no problem i will stop that story sorry sometimes again we'll say i'll finish this so two types of people arth and artharthi people who are wanting more power more money they have to be given what they want the law of the universe except donald trump somebody like donald trump recently probably knows what he believes in god so he's not asking for these things mm -hmm. he's just wanting yeah right? at the That's moment he is wanting with his own power and strength at the yeah. moment he is wanting from with his own power and strength yeah. so first he will accumulate more and more with his own power and strength mm -hmm. then there will come a desire in him that with my ability i have gone this but this is not satisfying me so now he will move to god my lord i want more mm -hmm. i want more we have stories like this mm -hmm. we have stories where a person acquired as much wealth as possible we have in india story huge amount of gold material they have collected with their own power and then they wanted more but they couldn't get that more on their own power then they start paying my lord i want more my lord so he's not even as far as he can go he can go further in this yeah, yeah. but if all of us know more than that we may have already ourselves learned this lesson yes, yes. and fallen down we are in a blessed place that for us we already know and we don't need to be afraid of them and their inevitable journey they will go on that whole journey all we have to do is make sure that our amplification for justice is greater than theirs for greed we are not powerless we have the courage and the determination the power that they have is external power it's not real power it's not authentic power authentic power is inside no, that, that is true, but that power is also affecting us. No? It so is affecting, affecting us. So she's right. We do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. um, if we however, let it. everything boils down to consciousness. So if the consciousness of, you know, the, the frequency of love is so much higher than that of fear, anyone who is striving for external power is based in fear. It's a fear of lack, fear of not being enough, fear of not having enough. They always want more, more, more. And the misidentification is that they will get it from the outside. It's, it's external. So as more and more of us become identified with the internal power, which is love, our vibration goes up, our frequency is much higher and more powerful. And the shift will come about because of the um, because because it'll be a critical mass. Once it's a critical mass, things have to change. Just to answer that question of yours directly, whatever Donald Trump is doing, don't fight against that. He is doing things according to his nature, and he will keep on doing that. And if I fight, try to fight him, then I will also get involved in certain wrong things. And all the qualities of him which I'm not liking, they will start coming to me. I should not directly fight him. He is doing things according to his nature. What we have to do is we build up our strength of love inside. 
because we are not in that journey we are inside this inner journey we are all going into the inner journey we know that this inner power is the real power so let us strengthen the inner power of love compassion service and this inner power when it reaches a critical mass like she is saying critical mass that critical mass will neutralize his negative power that is the best way to oppose it yeah. reminds me of the start of your talk about harmony and that there has to be a balance the balance so when the when that bad becomes very high like in his case it is becoming very high and when that very high bad starts disturbing the lives of the people then what is the role of the normal people normal people has to strengthen the good inside them with that good they have to start neutralizing this when this good is not succeeding then the divine power will come and help this good but we have to all do our part the divine power will not come unless we do our part to strengthen the good inside and try to neutralize but not neutralize by that method which he is doing so not fighting him directly but strengthening the joy the beauty the harmony inside and neutralizing that so what is our role here to strengthen our love our compassion our understanding and to strengthen the good vibration to strengthen the good leaders who are the good leaders strengthen them then these good leaders will oppose the negative so Miji, we run a risk at this time. So many people end up in the state where they're wringing their hands and they're focusing on what Trump is doing and how bad things are. And that is not helpful, right? That we helpful. must focus on faith, understanding the journey, being courage, yeah. being strong. Mm -hmm. For as much energy as we spend into mm -hmm. lamenting this, we are contributing to, a, to do it. Mm -hmm. Yes, but doesn't there come a time to take action to counterbalance this? For example, uh, the story in the National Guard. So if nobody took any action as environmental activism, it would have been destroyed and avoided by the world. But because of all the outpouring of activism, they saved this little tiny section. Inaction is not a solution. Before you go for that activism, all that you have to do, activism is good. I get that point. And activism, we have to always come out to uh, oppose the negative. But before I start that activism outside, I must learn to strengthen something inside me. Otherwise, in that process of activism, I will come out with my anger, my hatred, my jealousy, will, my stress will start increasing. So first, let us strengthen something inside of me, then come out. Like, like people like Martin Luther. Martin Luther came out, but before Martin Luther could come out, he had done an inner work inside. You get this? People like Mahatma Gandhi, they first do an inner work. Then they come out. So before I start doing my external activity, let me do the inner work first. Otherwise, just an external activity will only make me weaker and, yeah. and yes. more stressful, more the stressful. Become I'll become another. Huh? The activism has to come from love. Yes, the activism has to come from a position of Otherwise, tremendous love. Easy. Tremendous love. You have to see the you have to see the movie. It's a three-hour movie on Mahatma Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. By Attenborough, huh? In that, yeah, is that the old? Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. When the, when the he just went for the salt flats, and they hit one person, and the next person came, and uh -huh. next, that's yeah. what like, sticks in my mind. Uh, so, what you're talking about? Uh huh? Oh, they were active activism about the salt flats and English. It oh. was nonviolent activism. Yes. And yeah. so they were in a long line, and mm -hmm. the first person came to the Got hit by the British. Hit by the British. The, the, side. the next person came, but they never raised a hand. Can you understand that how difficult it was for Gandhi to put so many people into that sort of a non violent activism? How much love and power you have to have inside to make so many people do that non violent activism? That is what is spiritual strength. And, and if we just go out to do an active activism, then your anger, your stress, everything will be. You will become low energy. You can't directly fight the negative without your building up the positive first. So, is that the so my solution to your question is yeah. go out and active, but always have come back and have at least one hour of your own time where you sit in silence to calm down your emotion and you find your peace. Then again, go out, do the activism, but come back. 
come back. Don't keep that in your mind rolling around. Otherwise, your negativity will increase. You have to always find your own time. When I come out and give these lectures, I'm just saying, I'm not doing good work. But in these lectures also, I am expending tremendous amount of energy. Those who are receptive, they get it. Now, when I go back, I have to immediately get back to my own meditation, my own calmness to regain that energy. Otherwise, doing this good work itself will make me stressed, make me rich. So whenever we are doing good work also outside, that good work has to be based on a inner strength inside. You get this? So activism is good, but based. Okay. Nelson Mandela is one more great example. 25 years in a prison to have that tranquility before he united a country. Yeah. Overcoming great. I mean, he had to work hard. He had to be in a room that was tiny for 25 years and then he united a country. Okay, the last two words in this. The third type of people are jignyasu, jignyasu, seekers of truth. We fall into this category, third category, seekers of truth. And the fourth category are called jnani, persons who have known God, have experienced God. They are called the fourth category of people. So first category is distressed. Second category is seeking money and power. Third category is seekers of truth, where we are. And the fourth category is the ones who have known God, have experienced God. So any advice that we give to people, spiritual advice, it has to be based on what is that individual situation at this moment and then give the advice. With this, five minutes, let us do a little quiet meditation. Then today we will have a little prasad. What is prasad? My wife is very particular. He says, we have to give something to people. So she went herself. She got this prasad. I wanted to give to everybody. But before the five minutes meditation. You want to go somewhere? Just somebody must always come up to help. <laughs> okay, if she can go, fine. Every time somebody should be ready to immediately help. It's interesting that this, the, the, the people in distress are a lower order than the people wanting power and money. Is that because they're weaker? Huh? They're weaker. Because they're weak. And they're weakness weak. is not spirituality. Yes. Weakness is not that you see, you see, Hitler, for example, Hitler. Now let us say Hitler is a negative. But if Hitler, if Hitler can be convinced that he has to yes. turn for power inside, mm -hmm. that guy will get enlightened in 24 hours. But a weak person will not get enlightened in 24 lives. Because if Hitler can be told, look, Hitler, you just sit like this. You sit for 10 hours and you will get enlightened. If Hitler is told like this, he will sit, he will not go to the bathroom, he will not eat, he has determination, he has strength, he will sit like this. But we weaklings, we go like this. No strength. So weakness in any form is not spirituality. So people, those who are sick and suffering, we have to see in that sickness, some people may be weak and some people may not be weak. Those who are not weak, even in that pain and suffering, they have to be given some up. And those who are weak, they have to be given. So that understanding has to happen to before we start advising. But any form of weakness is not considered good. That is why this Bhagavad Gita teaching, our Indian culture says, before you start even understanding, you have to first go and play football. We say, play, like in, uh, in America, play this football. First, make yourself physically, mentally strong by doing things outside. Then come and study this. So weakness in any form is not spirituality. And these people like Donald Trump, they have got a very good quality. They have all bad qualities, but they have got a good quality is they are very determined. Whatever they want, by hook and crook, they will have it. So if they can be influenced, that look, this is not the right side. Come here. If they can be influenced, 
then they will come. And then they will be very quick, very quickly they will evolve, very quickly. So not to be looked down upon these evil people as extremely bad. They are bad momentary. Very soon they can change. In my culture, in my culture, we had a king. You should all know that king was called King Ashok. He was a Hindu king who went about conquering territories within India. And at one moment when he saw all these dead bodies, he had a change of heart. And in one life from a bad king, he became one of the best kings ever of my culture. It's like Milarepa. Milarepa, Milarepa, another We're example. the movie this month. Uh -huh. <laughs> Milarepa, yeah, good example. That's a good example. Good example. Too. But they have to go through that process. Mm -hmm. And before that process is complete, if we advise, any amount of advice will not work. They will not change. They will not change. So what is the point? What is the point of fighting with Donald Trump? Because that is his nature. He will go for more money, more power, hook, group, whatever I will do. What is the point of fighting him? The fighting has to be done by strengthening my truth. I should be truthful, I should be honest, and those uh, leaders who are today truthful, honest, not taking money, they should be strengthened. And as we strengthen the leaders, they are opposed. By criticizing, he is bad, he is bad. If I criticize Donald Trump is bad, Donald Trump is bad. What is happening in my bad? I am creating that, I am creating that bad in my mind. <laughs> so, what is the point of creating that bad in my mind? Huh? You resist, persist, and go strong. What? Oh, beautiful. What you resist, persist, and go strong. Yeah, so these are the wisdom. This is the wisdom of the ages. What you resist, persist, and go strong. That's what worries me so much of the democratic, you know, um, talk by the candidates is they, they, they constantly talk about fighting and resisting, you know, and I think. If only they would talk about we can do better, you know. And of course they do, and they their policies are good, mm -hmm. but they still talk a lot about resisting and fighting. Just one sentence, because she started off this: the Democratic Party. I am a part of Democratic Party. My my demo. I am a part of Democratic Party. So I am saying myself: I will never do anything to defeat Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Defeating Donald Trump is not my purpose. My purpose is within my democratic party, I have to create a strength of power where my leaders of my democratic party should not be a slave of the billionaire donor class. If I can create a few good leaders in my democratic party who don't take money from the billionaires, then that will automatically happen. But if my leaders are also taking money from billionaires, what will I fight? Even if I fight, I will create the same person like that. So without trying to bother about other party and other people, let me start, let us make our party, our leaders, not be a slave of the billionaire donors. That is the solution for democratic party. But I am not there, I cannot. If I wanted, I could have, but I cannot. So I come in this small group, I keep saying. If some of you want, you must choose leaders who are not taking money from the billionaire class. And don't ever worry, oh, this person, he cannot win. Oh, this person, he can't defeat Trump. That is not the right idea. If this person is a good person, and if he cannot defeat Trump, God will come to help this good person. But you have to find the good person first. And if you think Bloomberg, huh? yeah. <laughs> Bloomberg, if you choose Bloomberg to defeat Trump, then you are ignorant. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Some people think Bloomberg has 60 billion, he will be the best leader to defeat Trump. Then Bloomberg will become another Trump. Huh? So we have to decide. Beating Donald Trump is not the purpose. Purpose is in my party. I have to have leaders who don't take money from the billionaires who will work for me and not for the billionaire class, who will work for the common person. That person has to be strengthened. And whether that person can defeat Trump or not, that doesn't matter. We invoke God, my Lord, now we have done this, come help. It will happen. 
But if we choose the wrong person, we can't win. So decide whom will you vote. I will not mention any names. <laughs> <laughs> Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. Beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. Absolutely. Don't fight the existing model. Create a new model. We have to create that new model and not fight that model by something similar. That is what the Democratic Party is making a mistake and they will never win. If they don't change the model, there is a person who is there to change the model, but if we can't understand, nothing will change. <clears throat> okay. When Jesus was also there, Jesus was the greatest man of his time, but still people killed him. The people, are, people don't understand who is good. There can be the best person right in front of me, but my mind doesn't understand what to do. There can be the right leaders, but I choose the wrong leaders. Out of my fear, my fear, I choose the wrong leaders. What can be done? Is she coming back? Just five minutes. You already time out. Just five minutes. Calm down, let us calm our emotions. And then we will in a calm emotion, we'll take the prasad. So just a few minutes. The whole body eyes closed. On this auspicious Shivaratri day, tell yours, my Lord, my Lord, I am invoking you. After this intellectual understanding, I wish to have you to guide my intellect. Come to me, my Lord. Karpura Gauram Karunavataram Sansar Saram Bhujagendraharam Sada Vasantam Vridayar Vrinde Bhavam Bhavani Sahitam Just one minute in this silent moment, make a very strong emotional, emotional call, call to God, the higher power, my own soul. Give a call to strengthen compassion, love, forgiveness 
in my heart first, in my mind, in my heart. That is why we chant that mantra, Devi mantra. Many times I have chanted, Ya Devi Sarva Bhuteshu Shanti Rupena Samstita Namastasai 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 Namo Nama. O oh, Divine Mother, give me so much of peace that any external circumstance doesn't disturb my peace. I bow down to you. Bow down to you. Give me peace. Give me strength. Give me love. Give me forgiveness. Give me compassion. Now join your hands and we will chant this mantra three times. If anybody amongst your loved ones needs a little healing energy, send the energy to them. All of you inhale. Oh. Inhale. Mm -hmm. 